scholars at two universities in the US, two universities in Canada, and two universities in Mexico looking at uh, the gender dimensions of human rights, citizenship, and identities in North America at a time when, so post-NAFTA, so when, when at that time we were thinking a lot about this idea of North America and whether it, how much credence it had for example, in relation to the European Union, which has a lot of weight, whereas North America, you know, we kind of question that more because to what extent does Mexico and Canada have much in common or the US and Mexico and, and so on. Um, so we were asking questions about this. We received funding, in fact, from all three governments to do this transnational project where we were able to get together with our students, including undergraduate and graduate students, and then also with us as faculty um, to exchange ideas together in one space, including in Mexico one summer and at York University in Canada another summer. Um, and then also have, we had online courses where students from all six institutions in the three countries were online together talking about these issues. And it was really a transformative experience to be thinking about these issues of mobility um, has Professor Moladina introduced them in this much more um, complex and I would say realistic way, right? How, how and why do people move? Why do they choose to cross borders and when? Who gets to cross borders and how? Who, don't, who doesn't get to cross borders? These were all the kinds of questions that we were asking along with questions about how does nationalism play into these discussions and to our preconceived notions about ourselves and people from the other countries in the region. We're having technical difficulties tonight, so. <laughs> what? Yes. This? Yeah. Is it working? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. No, that turned. I think it turned it. Can you hear me? Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So that project culminated in this book. Um, there are several chapters in it that some focus specifically on, on NAFTA and the economic aspects of this process. Others focus on more political, social, cultural aspects. I'm going to um, present to you tonight uh, the chapter that I wrote with a former student of mine who is now a geographer at the University of Arizona. Um, and we looked specifically at the U.S.-Mexico border itself, that border region, and how that region was being militarized and what that meant for migration, for mobility, and for the people who live in that region. I know there's a lot of discussion now about what's happening uh, in the Trump era. I'm, I'm going to take us back in time a little bit to think about some of the earlier um, manifestations, if you will, of immigration policy and border policy that have contributed to the context in which we're having discussions about building a wall and so on and so forth. So hopefully that will, that will give us context to maybe talk about the similarities and differences between what was happening 20, 30 years ago and, and what's happening now. So I'll cover a number of issues, including just the idea of borders and borderlands. Um, we're, of course, thinking about states and territory and then how the U.S.-Mexico borderland is thought about in terms of it being a region that's both different from Mexico, although part of it, and also different from the U.S., although part of it. Um, talk a little bit about the idea of mobility and immobility has a perhaps a, a, an alternative way of thinking about migration. Um, the idea of nationalism, um, border security and insecurity, and of course the gender dimensions of, of this for both women and men, but I'll focus a little bit more on just a few examples of um, the experiences of women migrants as, has, as they have crossed the border and uh, what they've experienced in that journey. So if we think about securing the border in historical perspective, this so-called rebordering that we hear about in the news a lot now, in fact, started a long time ago, 
and certainly even before this time period that I'm um, pointing out here, but in terms of the actual physical securing and militarization of the border, I would think of it as a post-World War II phenomenon in particular, where at least 28 border fences have been built um, between 1945 and the year 2010. Uh, much more has happened since then as well. Um, there's been a rebordering of that of the border itself and of that region in terms of how surveillance is taking place, um, in terms of virtual as well as physical forms of borders, in terms of how surveillance now is occurring in the interior of the U.S. and also in, for example, in many, I'm thinking a lot in the Americas because that's where I've done my work, so I'm limiting this to the Americas right now which I also think is very relevant to what's happening now in terms of the, the so-called Honduran caravan, and I'm going to get to a few of these other examples later on. But so this, this broadening of, of surveillance of migration, and that includes in every Latin American country now, there are um, ways that people are being deterred from, from leaving their countries, whether it be to migrate north to to Mexico or, or on to the U.S. or, or Canada. Um, the U.S.-Mexico border, it's 2,000 miles long. Um, one of the things that we found in this, in this bigger study was at the time there was a lot of discussion of securing the border, um, particularly um, in the post-9-11, 2001 era, with the, the fear of terrorists entering the U.S. And in fact, more people who have been found to um, enact or be planning to, to conduct acts of violence have entered through the Canada-US border than through the Mexico-US border. But this is one of the, the myths I think that we hear a lot is that somehow the US-Mexico border is much more dangerous. Um, these are just a few images of the border that just really show the, the stark contrast between um, the U.S. on one side and Mexico on the other, the lines to get across the border, and of course, if we consider how many families um, have for decades and centuries lived on both sides of the border, including um, particular uh, uh, um, tribal communities that uh, still have, that were split when the border was militarized, it made um, family communication much more difficult for many, many people uh, in the border region from California to Arizona to Texas. Um, so one aspect of this that we thought about a lot was how to think about borders as regions and spaces. Um, so on one hand, after NAFTA passed, there was all kinds of emphasis on open markets, right, the free market, the free market in North America, the um, getting rid of economic borders, um, the maquila sector in Mexico in particular, the sector where a number of multinational companies had moved um, to lower production costs, was often viewed as a denationalized space as a result of that because uh, it received special um, benefits uh, to, to housed their companies in that region, and they were also often considered and continue to be not entirely Mexican nor entirely American. They're certainly transnational, but they, they, they have in many ways um, uh, benefit much more than most M Mexican companies and citizens in general. Um, so if, if you have followed the history of the violence of, of feminicide or femicide, which is the killing of, of women, that has been so extreme in Mexico, in particular, also in Guatemala and other Central American countries. Um, a, a number of those incidents have been linked to uh, the maquila sector. They have been young, poor, working class, lower middle class, women who work in those factories and who have been murdered for a variety of reasons. Um, there's a lot of interesting work 
on that that I don't have time to go into. But um, these acts of violence, um, I think, also contribute to people thinking about these spaces as denationalized, right? That somehow they're, they're less controlled, less structured, um, free of nations. At the same time, these areas um, have been seen as being hyper-nationalized. That, um, that there is a kind of re-nationalizing of people who live there, of those communities as um, belonging to one or the other country. Um, certainly in the US, there's a lot of discussion, I think, about how that industry is linked, how the US has benefited that industry in northern Mexico. Um, and, and you'll notice that so far I've talked quite a bit about what's happening on the Mexican side of the border. So, and I think that's not a coincidence in terms of how we talk about and think about the U.S.-Mexico border, particularly in the U.S., um, but certainly there's a lot going on on the U.S. side as well that I'm going to talk about a little bit here. So that idea of denationalizing, hypernationalizing at the same time. And then I think beginning in the, in, the, in the 1990s was really the time when the border was increasingly militarized. Um, and by that, including with Operation Gatekeeper is probably the most well-known, um, but certainly several policies that have been put in place to um, create natural deterrence to border crossing. So uh, a push to close off borders in, say, California and parts of Texas so that migrants are forced to cross the border in the most dangerous areas, and that would be, the, for the most part, the desert areas. Hence the emphasis on, on Arizona and, and uh, I think Arizona and Texas have been the two places where, parts of Texas, where there have been a lot of crossing and a lot of migrant deaths as a, re as a result of that. Have some water. So we had that happening in the 1990s and then with 9-11-2001, we had the U.S. Homeland Security Act, and Border Patrol was tripled in a very short period of time. We're still at that, um, in that situation where Border Patrol is um, a much larger force than it was uh, before the 1990s. Most agents are on the U.S.-Mexico border, um, and as I mentioned, there are the interior, well, also interior checkpoints in the border region. So if you're driving, say, from LA to San Diego, you could potentially get stopped in your car just for a routine check. So it um, really raises questions about um, the right to be a citizen, the right to be, um, about human rights, you know? When, um, when you're stopped within a nation, um, and usually racially profiled, right? So, um, one thing I, I like to point out when I'm talking about this is how Border Patrol itself comes from border communities. So a lot of Border Patrol agents themselves come from families that have crossed the border, that have strong opinions about either the right to cross the border or the fact that other people should not cross the border. Um, this uh, image, you know, kind of shows how people know each other in these different positions. It's not, they're not always strangers. And, you know, if, even if they don't know each other, it's six degrees of separation quite often. This image, uh, shows where uh, a number of the Border Patrol stations are in that region. Arizona, New Mexico, through Texas, and also California. I'm happy to share this PowerPoint with you all afterwards, so going through some of these slides a bit quickly. Um, so in 2006, the Secure Fence Act is another significant um, act that 
led to an even broader definition of how the border should be patrolled, including various kinds of fencing, physical barriers, lighting, cameras, sensors, virtual forms of patrolling. This is also the era when a number of uh, citizen groups who were opposed to immigration, or uh, to undocumented immigration, would create their own websites so that you could be sitting in northern Minnesota and watch the border. And if you saw someone crossing it, you could then call the Border Patrol and tell them what you had just seen. Um, a number of those websites have been taken down. They, they get put back up, they get taken down. Um, this increased fencing, which I think is up to around 700 miles of the 2,000 miles of the border um, that have been built following this act, have uh, certainly contributed to additional deaths. And the reason why I, I say that is because of the forcing of immigrants to cross in, the, in more dangerous terrains or of having to cross rivers um, that have, and have, of having to spend more time even once they're within the United States to reach s safe places. Um, so that, for example, a number of non-governmental -gov organizations or, um, yeah, non-governmental organizations that work in the Southwest to simply prevent migrant death um, will put out water and the Border Patrol takes that away. So it's, there's this ongoing tension between, you know, criminalization of migrants versus more humane ways of addressing um, the flow of people across borders. So I just want to give you a few um, examples or give you an idea of the kind of violence that we have seen at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, the Missing Migrants Project estimates that over 10,000, there have been over 10,000 deaths since 1994. I think that's actually a really low number. Um, and if you look at this figure compared to other regions, say in Europe or um, uh, parts of Africa, this number might seem low actually, but nonetheless it's high and I think it's probably much higher than, than the statistic. Um, there have been many remains of, of migrants found. I just gave you the, the info for 2016 and 2017 of around, you know, for over 400 deaths in 2017. So this is continuing. It's not, so what's happening is there, there has actually been a decrease um, setting aside things like what we're witnessing with the Honduran caravan right now um, and other waves of migration like that. Um, there's been a, a general decrease in people trying to enter the U.S., but there's been an increase in deaths and, of course, an increase in um, detain, detain, detaining uh, people who have crossed the border and an increase in criminalizing them. Female migrants are particularly vulnerable to, to death because of conditions, again, of the, the environment, the 2.6 times more likely to die from exposure. Um, women migrants are often with children. Um, this isn't even including unaccompanied children who migrate because that's a whole other um, kind of major uh, portion of people who are crossing the border. Um, this, uh, when we first did this project, we were, we were trying to point out that most of the deaths in the border region were not happening only in Mexico because there was such an emphasis on femicides in Mexico. Kind of has this thing that was Mexican, right? And so that if there was violence and it had to have been imported from Mexico as opposed to violence within the US. So one of the things we were doing was looking at the kind of quantitative and qualitative data to, um, see what was really going on. And so this gives you an idea of, this is one project that mapped migrant deaths in um, lower Arizona. Um, and there's a lot of 
you know, there, there have been vigilante groups also that have just taken it upon themselves to kill anyone who looks like a migrant. And in fact, they once in Arizona killed a, um, a, an insurance salesman who was in a truck just going out into a more rural area to, to make a sale. He happened to be Latino and he was killed because they thought he was, had just crossed the border. So another aspect of what women encounter, not only women, men also, but um, more women than men, um, are, is, are various kinds of sexual violence. Um, there are a number of reports that women who have been, who are in detention centers will report having been raped or violated in one way or another um, by, for example, the coyotes, the people who have um, taken them across the border. But um, certainly there have been a number of incidents of border patrol agents who have also uh, been found guilty of this. And I think that one of the, maybe the main points of this is simply that in a context of extreme militarization and um, insecurity and political violence, if you will, uh, that th there is often increased forms of sexual violence as well. Um, many women who, who plan to migrate, whether they're coming from Mexico or from Chile, uh, will get birth control before they go precisely to prevent pregnancy from um, possibly being um, attacked. Um, so there's a lot of studies that show, you know, that have, where scholars have interviewed women who have reported taking birth control for that, for that reason in anticipation <coughs> of their border crossing. It's become such a normalized, naturalized, normalized part of their experience. Um, <coughs> just a little water here. <laughs> U.S. Border Patrol has also begun in the late 1990s and until now to focus on humanitarian efforts. Um, and a lot of the, the language, and this is where it became interesting uh, to us to think about the, the discourse around how men and women migrants were, were framed because uh, female migrants were often framed as being in need of protection, to have been um, in need of rescue. Uh, so, you know, if, you, if any of you have read Gayatri Spivak, for example, uh, the idea of um, uh, white men rescuing brown women from brown men that kind of discourse came into these efforts uh, quite a bit. So female migrants were seen as victims and yet at the same time as criminals once they were on the U.S. side of the border and were processed for having crossed illegally. Uh, and in that same discourse, um, the U.S. is portrayed as a land of safety for migrant women in the U.S. state is seen as a benevolent protector. Um, so border militarization in this context becomes the logical solution to maintaining the sexual integrity of immigrant women and of the U.S. as a nation. So this is one way that I, as a, as a gender studies scholar, think about how ideas about gender are central to these much broader narratives and ideas that we have about the nation, about mobility, um, about citizenship, uh, and so on. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, certainly violence is often portrayed as something that is brought into the country from Mexico. And I mean, one thing that I always like to think about and have discussions about is how, you know, what are the, if you, if you think about it from an international relations perspective and a historical perspective, what are the reasons why there's so much violence in a country like Mexico today? You know, it's, it's not only because of what's happening in Mexico. It's because of so many other reasons, such as, for example, the fact that 
guns were given freely to many people to take over the border to supposedly stop um, narco-trafficking violence, that just fueled the violence instead of ending the violence. That was a U.S. government policy or practice. So I, I, I do think it's important to think about um, not only what's happening in terms of migration from there to here, but what's happening from here to there, historically. Because if we don't think about that, then we're not going to understand why what's happening there is happening. <laughs> the world is so much more interconnected than, than what some of these you know, narratives um, kind of lead us to believe. So this kind of brings us to some of the discussions we're having in this country now. You know, what do we do in light of this context? Um, there are so many, and I think, I think these are some of the most important things to think about, is what are some concrete solutions to this? Given that it's, it's actually not getting better, it's getting worse. Um, and by, by worse, I mean, the, I don't mean the number of people wanting to cross the border necessarily, I mean the conditions in our world that contribute to people wanting to move or, or being forced to move or um, feeling that they need to move um, in, in search of better opportunities, whether they be economic or, or other forms of opportunity. So certainly, I mean, one big category here would be comprehensive immigration reform, which um, people, politicians have not agreed on uh, for quite a while now. Um, but the path to naturalization for certain groups of people um, people who have lived in this country for a very long time and yet still have no path to naturalization, to citizenship. The decriminalization of undocumented people, um, which has been kind of, I think states have been chipping away at protections for undocumented people. Um, and to a point where now it's very difficult for people to access health care, sometimes go to school, um, uh, and I, mean, I could go on, but those are two of the big ones. Um, you know, how can we think about the border as a place that we don't need to militarize? So Trump has proposed building a wall that would be, I think, 55 feet high, and it would cost something like 40 billion dollars or something really crazy like that. And the, the truth is, we have so many fences and borders and walls now, and people are going to keep moving. It's just, that's not going to go away. If, in, in my informed un viewpoint, um, unless we think differently about how resources are distributed, why we have rich and poor countries, some of these much bigger questions. But certainly, we could do better um, more immediately by thinking about why people move um, and wish to find a better um, opportunities for themselves and their families. We could think about these things in, in more humane and compassionate ways. Um, and I, I would say that certainly in the last year and a half that we've seen the, the opposite of that, right? We've seen family, um, you know, separating families. Um, we've seen children who have been forced to be in their own detention camps. Um, we have, you know, pathways to um, undocumented people who want to apply for asylum have been increasingly limited. I know that um, Jeff Sessions, the, his new um, mandate on the AB, sort of on asylum guidelines um, uh, have taken out um, socially protect protected groups on the basis of being a victim of intimate partner violence um, and also on the basis of being a victim of gang violence. And a lot of women have, um, in fact, 
uh, receive asylum for that reason, um, intimate partner violence or some kind of gender-based violence that has become more and more difficult for, for attorneys and to um, defend them, to help them receive asylum. Uh, and we have yet to see what will happen with that, but that's a, that's a place to, th to think about. That's an area to think about. Um, we uh, have yet to know what's going to happen with, with DACA, with Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, you know, students, dreamers, um, uh, the DREAM Act, which was never passed at a federal level, but which has passed in, excuse me, in some form in at least 18 states, uh, would all protect young people who have been in this country since, um, probably since they were so young they don't remember their home country. Um, but we have yet to see, I mean, that would be an obvious group to um, offer amnesty or a path to citizenship. Um, and so this is just an image from the, this most recent so-called caravan from Honduras um, that uh, crossed through Guatemala, is now mostly in Mexico. Some people turn back, but then more people join them. Um, there, I, I was just reading today that they think there's now more than 10,000 people in the caravan, in the caravan um, heading to the border. Th a similar thing happened in 2017. Um, I know that the Trump administration is concerned about this, but this kind of desperation is something that, I at least in, in, in the Americas, that we haven't seen on this scale in, in a long, long time um, between what's happening in Honduras and also the exodus from Venezuela. So Venezuelans in the last four years uh, have you know, gone pretty much to most countries in South America and to some countries in the Caribbean. So um, this is just a, a map of where some Venezuelans have gone. They've kind of gone all over, including to the US. Um, so this really, I guess, raises these bigger questions of, of what can we as, um, has people interested in um, protecting human rights? What can we do? How can we think differently about the economy that undergirds some of these structural inequalities? What can we do about thinking about citizenship differently um, and going beyond a legal definition to think about what does it mean to belong in a country what does it mean when our country is, is based on the labor of undocumented migrants and yet um, as a society, undocumented migrants are still demonized? Um, I, I guess what, what gives me hope in part have been, have been the dreamers and others who have come out uh, who have has undocumented, which is a very courageous move, I think, historically to to create a movement um, of coming out as undocumented and given the risks that they, that they face um, and other individuals as well, not just, not just the self-identified dreamers or people who qualify for DACA, but many other people as well. Um, this is one thing that gives us hope. Uh, it's certainly not a partisan issue, I would point out. This is an image from when Obama was still president and has of now more people were deported during the Obama administration than, than during the Trump or any other Republican administration. So this is not a, uh, um, just a, it's something to think about in a much broader sense. And if we th look back historically at some of the biggest amnesty programs, they've occurred during Republican governments. <laughs>
some of the artwork that's come out on the border. This is just documenting deaths along the border. Um, one could do a whole project just looking at resistance art along the U.S.-Mexico border that I think would be really fascinating um, to do and compare with other border places, another um, piece of art on the border. Might be hard to see these images, but so I just, I wanna end there. Um, I feel like I've, I've raised a lot of big questions, um, but I've, I've tried to at least give us a sense of how we can think further about not only the gender dimensions of this, but how we can think differently as Professor Moladina um, introduced in the beginning about migration and mobility and about why and how people move across borders. So, thank you. Questions, comments? Uh -huh. Maybe you could talk more about you know, the space and fearlessness and having more public involvement. Like, do you think that things have happened historically on that to the history of Puerto Ricans, and how does that help with this question? No, because, for example, George W. Bush um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the right term. <laughs> um, initiated an asylum, I mean, sorry, um, an amnesty program that uh, is one of the ones that I'm thinking of that you might want to look up. Um, I'm blanking on the full name of it right now. Um, but I, I think that ideologically things were quite different then than now in terms of what a Republican president or Democratic Democratic president felt that they could do around the issue of immigration. So I do think that it's changed a lot since then, yeah. Other questions? That's what, did you hear that? Okay. Um, so th the question of how did economic development in Mexico influence femicide is a really good question and a, and a huge question and one that we still don't have really good answers for. But particularly we don't have answers for specifically who is doing it, although there's a lot of evidence that points to it being linked to other processes of violence. Um, including involving um, police security um, uh, tied to narco trafficking, tried to powerful people, economic and politically powerful people in the region. Um, but I think, so it also has to do with anxieties around change that come about with economic development. So, for example, when the maquila sector became big, most of the workers were, I mean, the, the ideal worker was female, right? The f woman who, a young woman who um, wasn't, um, who, who didn't have children, right? And I mean, in, indeed, in the, in, the, in the initial days, they would give mandatory pregnancy, uh, pregnancy tests to female workers to make sure that they weren't pregnant, um, uh, who had nimble fingers, so the whole nimble fingers argument, um, who could you know, work with manufacturing either electronics or fabric or garments or various things, um, and who wanted to work but didn't necessarily need what was considered a primary wage for the family, e even if it was, and who supposedly had more flexible time, so they didn't necessarily need to work for 40 hours a week. Um, so they were the, you know, the ideal flexible worker for um, a multi multinational company. Um, and there's all kinds of 
feminist perspectives on this. I'm thinking of someone like uh, Linda Lim, um, who goes decades back, but she, um, I believe she was from Singapore. Um, but she was someone who was really opposed to the conditions of female workers in, in, in the maquila sector and other multinational free trade zones. And she totally flipped on that and then started working for multinationals because she thought actually it was giving women better rights. It's a really interesting history to follow. Um, so in northern Mexico, a number of women had jobs, often more than men. And those jobs often paid better than, say, their husbands' jobs or other men in their families or in the community. And so there was a lot of anxiety that became a kind of gendered anxiety around the fact that it was hard for men to find jobs still, yet supposedly the region was developing because of the maquila sector, and yet the jobs were going to women. So there was, I think, anxiety. I think there was resentment. And I mean, we've seen this in a number of different instances. Um, uh, Iwa Ong has written about this um, um, in her work um, in Malaysia. Uh, and where these kinds of anxieties around this much broader process of economic development um, gets placed or displaced onto women's bodies or onto particular groups of people's bodies, right? I mean, the racialized bodies and gendered bodies and class bodies. So I think in the case of, of femicide that women who worked in that industry were often targeted. They were seen, you know, they were called all kinds of things. If, if um, you know, they were called, you know, whores. Um, they were really seen as um, disposable bodies. And um, who exactly has been doing it? I can't answer that question. I mean, I, I could have a much longer conversation about all the different actors in it, but I think that's some of the, the, the representations of gender that, and race and class, I would say, that, um, that shaped how and why it was that group of women that w was particularly targeted. Does that answer your question? <laughs> So I saw a hand up over here. Uh -huh. Those are really good questions, thank you. Um, I'm gonna think a long time about the second one too. Um, but so let me answer the first question first about trade liberalization and border militarization. Um, yeah, that's ex of course that seems very counterintuitive. And I think that's was one of the driving questions behind this project at the time. I mean, things have changed a little bit since then, but or shifted, I guess. But because, in fact, there was that assumption that somehow the borders between these three countries, in this case of NAFTA, um, would open. And in some ways they did. But I also think that um, if we look at Mexico, for example, and what happened to the agricultural sector, or what happened to um, some companies in Mexico that were, um, that where Walmart became uh, a more dominant player than the Mexican version of, of Walmart. So that, there were those kinds of losses, I think, 
particularly in the, in the Mexican economy, but certainly in some sectors in the US and Canada, um, that, that led to potentially greater, uh, to an exacerbation of economic inequalities within and across these borders, within and across these countries. And so, of course, that doesn't stop migration. Um, and um, I think combined with, so 1994, the late 90s, they're working on NAFTA and looking at various effects of it. But then 2001, the discussion on securitization just became central. And um, so I think between the longer standing um, fear of Latin Americans migrating to the U.S. and then with um, the increased emphasis on securitization of borders, particularly post 9-11, that we saw both of those things happening at the same time. So we're really talking about some bodies have mobility whereas others have less or, or don't have as much um, or have none. Um, and we've certainly seen that if, if you follow just different visa categories and how they've changed over the years to accommodate certain kinds of employees, say in Silicon Valley versus the kinds of visas that um, temporary agricultural workers get. Um, and now, you know, the, the, the very limited kinds of visas that people from particular countries can get, if at all, um, that, that we've always, there's always been that tension. So I think it's more of, uh, I'm not convinced that there was much of an opening, to be honest. I mean, I, I think there was an opening in terms of particular economic sectors um, that perhaps led to mobility among certain kinds of workers or certain kinds of people, but I think in general that You know, there's also the backlash of each country becoming more nationalist vis-a-vis -vis NAFTA in the same way that European countries have become, some have become more nationalist vis-a-vis -vis the EU. So that's kind of a long-winded <laughs> um, answer to that. Um, I'm not even, I'm not sure where to begin with your second question. It's a really good question about death and immobility and um, necropolitics and just the way that some bodies are viewed as disposable and continue to be viewed as dis disposable to such an extent that they remain invisible. And that's one of the reasons why we emphasize the US side, because when we first started doing this, there was no discussion of what was happening in the US. It was all about, oh, how terrible things are happening in Mexico and you know, once migrants get here, well, maybe, you know, maybe they're un undocumented, but they're, they're in better hands, you know, even if, even if we put them in a detention center. <laughs> so um, I will continue to think about your question. Thank you. Any other questions? That's a good question. Um, so one of the things that I have been doing, this is actually kind of a side project for me. I've, a lot of my work has been in, in the Andes and in South America more generally. And since there's been a shift to the left, which is now shifting back to the right, I, w what I do is I look at economic development frameworks and governance frameworks and, and how and why we need to look at those together. So that's 
political economy as, as I see it. And I think it's important. And I think it's especially important um, when thinking about how econo economic development occurs in poor countries that have to negotiate a lot with institutions like the World Bank and IMF and so on. So um, we've seen South-South trade associations as well um, that haven't worked that well, quite frankly. But I can see, I mean, I, that's a huge generalization. But I mean, I, given that, I, so I'm going to, I'm answering this from the perspective of, of a poor country. So given that um, um, any country that has received a loan from the IMF, so, you know, Latin America, Mexico was the first country in, in the world to um, say, state that it was going to default on its loan repayment and, um, and the first country to be bailed out. And with those bailouts, um, the terms, of course, were that the country had to um, operate on a one-on-one on on one individual basis with the institution, right? So countries were not allowed to work together to create South-South trade associations. Um, and I think that's one thing that came out of this, this shift in the, in the region. And um, to some extent, it allows for countries to help each other more in, in economically and otherwise. I mean, we could talk about, you know, I mean, who benefits from trade and who doesn't, but just thinking in this broader sense. Um, uh, so I, I think those are interesting experiments. Um, I think that, so when NAFTA first started, um, I was, uh, along with my doctoral advisor, her name is Lourdes Benardia, she's an economist, and um, we, did the, we were cons uh, hired by a United Nations agency to do a, a report on the, the gender dimensions of, of NAFTA. So we were looking at different economic sectors and you know what it might mean for women and men in given sectors. And um, there was a lot of hope. But I think that in most trade association networks, I don't think there's enough done on, on the humanitarian aspects of it as you're talking about. I mean, I think there's some discussion of environmental impacts, um, but I think there could be more. Um, Maybe you can do that after you. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? In the back? That's a good question. Um, so I'm going to answer that in two, two really different ways. I was talking to this friend of mine the other day who happens to be a, a medical doctor in, in Texas. And she was telling me that it's, it's really hard because as a, as a doctor with a small practice, um, a lot of people come in who, who, who don't have documents and don't have, to have health insurance. Um, and just out for, eth for ethical reasons, she treats them. But um, in terms of maintaining her business, it's really difficult, right? And so I like to, I, 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 I get that. I like to think about, th this is why I think I went to global political economy. <laughs> um, which maybe isn't the answer for everyone, but it helps me think about how to better understand what's happening in my daily life when I think about, oh, so these you know, historical processes and um, 
changes that have occurred and how this region is related to that region um, really helps me think about the food we eat every day, um, what the clothes we wear, how we think about, certainly how we think about our country or how we think about ourselves in terms of like the nationalist ideologies we've learned. Um, so I, I try to find that balance when I'm having conversations with people who um, are not compassionate to people who don't have documents. But um, how to how to affect change? I mean, I think there's so many different ways we can. I honestly think just doing um, something small in your community makes a huge difference. I mean, I, I feel better when I do that. I mean, I, you know, whether it be um, working for an organization that, and this, I'm just thinking of this particular topic now, but that, that works on um, the rights of immigrants, um, whether it be um, learning Spanish. <laughs> Every language we know opens up new worlds. It makes a huge difference. Um, so I canvass in Spanish-speaking Spanish neighborhoods for certain politicians um, because there are never enough canvassers who speak Spanish. Um, those are just a couple of examples, but it, it's really a subjective thing. So I don't think there's a formula for it, um, but I, I do think that this stuff is always here, it's always been here whether it's this topic or a different one. And so it's just how do we move forward, keep and act ethically as we move forward, regardless of what career we end up in, if you will. I don't know if that helps, but. <laughs> Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, <laughs> definitely. I mean, that's, um, I, mean, I, I, I guess that's what I was getting at earlier but didn't go into, um, is certainly with Honduras is a, is a wonderful example of that. Um, this, you know, n a few years ago, the U.S. was very involved in, in, s in blocking the, the leading socialist candidate from winning the election, what people are, for the, most part calling a coup, um, although it wasn't a kind of military takeover specifically, but close enough. Um, and that instability that also greatly affected the economy has greatly contributed to what we're seeing right now. I mean, it's just clear that Hondurans are coming, or are leaving Honduras not because they love the United States, but simply because they know that they could find a better job and it would be potentially safer. Potentially because it all depends on where they live in the United States. And, you know, I think about the phenomena of gang violence in, in which kind of in Latin America first, I think, started mostly in Central America. But now, I mean, certainly we see it in Ecuador and Peru and, and many other countries, is entirely, in a sense, a U.S. export, in the sense that um, the gangs that exist now in the Americas um, exist because of people who were brought to this country when they were very young. Um, or who were originally born there and then lived here and then um, forced to move back to those countries for a variety of reasons, who s learned how to be part of a gang in, in New York or in L.A. or in somewhere in the United States. Um, so 
that's another kind of example. But going back even further, I mean, most Latin American countries have been dominated by multinationals, you know, the classic banana republics that were owned by Americans in, in many cases, um, and certainly the U.S.-backed coups, uh, especially in the 60s and 70s, but earlier and later as well. Um, there are so many connections. It's, um, I mean, I could teach a whole class on that topic, as you know. So, um, yeah, so thanks for asking that, because it, I do think it's really important to think about, again, not just why people are coming here, but what happened between these places historically, including colonization and colonialism and the whole history, right, of neocolonialism. I mean, what I've just been referring to is not formally colonialism, but certainly neocolonial. So, um, and that that's continues to be the case. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think a lot of these issues wouldn't be happening if it weren't for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think any kind of violence normalizes death. Militarization, um, if we think of the multiple ways in which a single location is being surveilled and the flow of people in that region. Um, the increased presence of, I mean, literally the increased presence of military equipment, of, of border patrol, um, and certainly an increased presence on, on the Mexican side as well, um, but for very different reasons. Uh, and not right on the border, but in that region. Um, it's dehumanizing. So if, if we're taught that um, certain bodies don't deserve to be, say, in, in the United States, right, that there are the deserving migrants migrants the undeserving ones and if we're taught that those who cr cross out of desperation or because they can't afford to any other way um, by foot say um, then they're already viewed as not entirely human as disposable and has a burden to the system. I mean, that's another important part of that, I think. So, I think one of the most insidious aspects of militarization are the forms of violence that, that, that aren't considered the traditional forms of political violence, right? So, um, things that have to do with ethnic cleansing and also with gender-based violence, for example, um, which are often both about protecting a certain kind of family over another, a certain community over another, um, where a, an ideal type of family or body is seen as better than that that is considered disposable. I mean, this is for me where the, the gendered aspect of that comes in, I guess, as well as certainly um, the racialized aspect of it. And 
because those things are already normalized by people, I think it's harder to understand in the context of militarization. Or, and not understand, but harder to gain traction among people to do something about it, if that makes sense. I mean, if we remember that it was in the 1990s that um, rape was first defined as a war crime by the United Nations, you know, that wasn't that long ago. Um, and so when it comes to other forms of um, gender-based violence, I mean, now we have the Me Too movement and we have, um, you know, just a focus on campus sexual violence, but much less so on, uh, say, the U.S.-Mexico border. I mean, there's, there are certain organizations that focus on that, but it's not seen as... Um, it's just seen as something that happens because they're crossing the border or because of, of this, um, this journey that they've taken. I'm not sure if I'm fully answering your question, but I'm just kind of thinking about it. And we'll definitely think about this more when I'm writing more about this, so thank you. Wow. <coughs> no, no. I've never been asked that before, but um, after a talk anyway, maybe after an interview, um, I would like to get your name so that I can, because I'm gonna continue to think about your question. Um, I guess I'm curious if, if what you all think about the current immigration, like how it's viewed as an immigration crisis, and do you think there are ways we can resolve it? Mm Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And that is so true. I mean, one of the things that I was talking about earlier was just, I was in Ecuador not that long ago for a conference, and I, you know, and there's also a, a big presence of Venezuelans there now, and um, just the, the, the incredibly xenophobic um, comments being made, you know, by people who have family members in Spain or the U.S. or, you know, who migrate between countries, and it's just so interesting how it just, I mean, part of that is, like, I, I want to ask, why do, why do we as human beings keep reproducing the same kind of us and them mentality? But, thank you. Great, thank you.